as uh, Sheen already uh, did it. Um, you probably received uh, uh, this set of notes, and uh, as far as I could do, uh, they are rather complete. Of course, they are uh, at least typos, at worst some, some errors, I hope not, but uh, I didn't check them thoroughly. I just compiled them, put together, uh, taking pieces from different, uh, 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 different uh, topics. So there is certainly much more than what uh, we are going to do here uh, in terms of uh, details, proofs, and in terms also of contents. Some of the contents uh, uh, I will uh, skip entirely, but I think it's useful to have them there because you can just check for yourself, for your curiosity, etc. One other thing is uh, that uh, references. Well, I, I, I couldn't really compile the references the way I wanted because simply, as you understand, uh, this first, today, this first part, will, uh, we will end with the background, so to speak, and we will focus more on uh, really uh, topological results from this today, from the second part and tomorrow. So uh, everything that is really new, uh, or rather new, is uh, not referenced properly. Although in the text you have uh, re you know, uh, quotations uh, to authors, uh, authors and ears, so it's easy on Google or whatever system you use, uh, a browser to check on, uh, on phishing for, for papers. So that is not a problem. But uh, I put down a list of, uh, well, there are 10, 11 uh, references to background material. And uh, some of these books are really wonderful. Some others, are, how to say, uh, good references, but uh, maybe uh, not so ideal for the course. Uh, so uh, today we will uh, uh, review in, uh, what, half an hour, uh, basics of uh, magnetohydrodynamics. And uh, just to make uh, clear that uh, we are on the same footing, everybody, uh, I have to start from scratch, more or less, so that we are... Uh, uh, we, we know what we're talking about. Uh, from scratch, magnetohydrodynamics uh, is a bit difficult task. So I will, uh, I will ask you to follow, um, to follow my suggestions. First of all, I just have to excuse if I want, use, uh, well, they are mentioned in the notes, but if I want, use uh, constant because they are constants. So I will assume that uh, all the constants we have uh, uh, won't, uh, won't affect uh, the key equations. And so I won't, I won't spend time to put uh, appropriate scaling in the equations. Okay, so this is one, one first big thing. Second thing is uh, that I want to go to Maxwell equations as quickly as possible. So I will uh, just start, uh, well, you have in the front page here, uh, uh, in the introductory notes, uh, information about these constants and the role they play in terms of uh, fluid that is uh, charged. So electric currents uh, are, are uh, present. And because the fluid moves with the velocity u, then these uh, uh, electric uh, uh, currents uh, produce uh, a magnetic field. Everything in the general setting is unsteady. And uh, with uh, these motions, uh, you produce also magnetic fields. And this is the idea um, in, in the magnetic context. I'll uh, rely on, a, on a one equation that we need before Maxwell is uh, the so-called Holmes law, and uh, is uh, just uh, relating 
the current J. So let's say that J is the electric current due to the motion of the electrons, electric current in the fluid. And we can decompose J in two terms. So one is uh, just due to conduction, and the other one is uh, due to advection. And uh, as you know, uh, the conduction uh, is uh, due to Ohm's law, which is, uh, well, this is the only constant I mentioned here, just to make sure that we understand each other, the electric conductivity. And this is uh, the electric field plus uh, U, the velocity of the, say, classical fluid, so to speak, uh, cross uh, B, where B is the magnetic field. And uh, from uh, uh, basic uh, observations and conservation laws, we can uh, derive the so-called, uh, I would put a pre here, pre-Maxwell equation. And these uh, are just relating possible sources or sinks first, sources or sinks effect, effects, and the second set of equations is uh, uh, just relating the change in time of these key quantities, electric field and magnetic field. So remember, you have always to play tricks in your mind to remember things. So that's my way to remember those. First, uh, thinking sources and sinks. And then a uh, second set, uh, thinking the change in time of these quantities. So for... Well, the first is easy because uh, uh, the divergence of an electric field is uh, due to the presence of a charge, of an electron or a charge. So I'll call it a rho E for the electron. And the second one is also easy because uh, uh, is, uh, I don't know if we may say, ongoing search for monopoles. So far, there have been... Uh, no monopoles observed, or, and so uh, we put a zero there. And mind you, for the young ones, uh, there are theories that are contemplating monopoles and have been developed to recast uh, these uh, Maxwell equations considering monopoles. So works are around. But these are the standard equations we refer to. And then we have to have uh, the change in time of uh, D, of E, and uh, the change in time of B. And uh, as we know, one talk to the other. So the EDT, the EDT is just uh, the curl of uh, B, the curl of B, and then this is constructed, uh, con contrasted by the current, and this is just a minus the curl of A. So these are so-called Maxwell equations. And uh, now we have to do some simplifications on these equations because we want to talk about uh, the ideal case, ideal MHD, ideal magnetohydrodynamics. And uh, so we have to do three simple assumptions to simplify our case. And further simplifications gives you the Kirchhoff's laws of uh, electric circuits. So an exercise, I was given an exercise by somebody when I was really young, I mean, uh, your age. And uh, so once you, learn, uh, once you learn these equations, then uh, please try your best uh, to uh, figure out uh, the laws of uh, electrostatics for a circuit, for electric circuits. And so that pushes you to understand what is, does it mean divergence of E? You know, it pushes you to understand better what does it mean a steady state, all these things. All right, so the first assumption, so assumptions, let's say assumptions for ideal. MHD, magneto hydro dynamics. All 
Okay, the first assumption, first assumption is, uh, I'd like to follow the order I put them down. First assumption is uh, that uh, we take a fluid to be electrically, electrically, I would say, sorry, it's better to say neutrally, electrically charged. Okay, so that means uh, that uh, J due to conduction is zero. So immediately we have from Holmes' law that if that is zero, then there is a direct relationship between E and uh, the field transported by the fluid. Okay, over there. So we will have E from from uh, Holmes' law. Uh, e will be minus U cross B. Okay, second assumption. Second assumption is a, a steady condition for E. So if E is uh, steady, that means uh, DE, DT is zero. And uh, so from, uh, from uh, Maxwell, Equation, we have uh, we have uh, d e d t zero. We have j equal uh, the curl of b. Ampere's law. Okay. Third assumption. Third assumption. Third assumption is uh, uh, the consideration that uh, perturbation, so to speak, due to uh, magnetic fields, uh, are traveling much, much at lower pace, so to speak, uh, lower speed than the speed of light. And these perturbations are waves that propagate on, on, on magnetic fields. And you remember we mentioned that already when I mentioned Alphen, who proposed to Fermi a derivation of the velocity of the uh, wave on a, on a magnetic line based on, from, de derived from classical principles, so to speak, and, and uh, Fermi had some doubts because he, he was thinking not of field lines, but of particles. And uh, so he was a little bit puzzled. Then he solved the, immediately the problem. But uh, um, uh, this uh, uh, analogy with the work of, uh, uh, with, with the elastic bands that is rooted in the words of Faraday. Faraday wrote to Maxwell saying, you know, uh, these, uh, these field lines uh, seem to uh, vibrate like an elastic string. When you perturb an el a tight string, uh, the vibrations uh, persist for some time. And so this is uh, one way to understand the behavior of uh, uh, magnetic field lines, because they do behave uh, very similarly. So uh, we have to introduce an alphan uh, speed, uh, speed, and say a velocity due to uh, these propagations is related to the magnetic field. And uh, this is uh, putting constants uh, once more here. We have uh, rho e and uh, mu. 
zero. Mu is typically the permeability, magnetic permeability in free space. And uh, so this uh, V uh, is uh, assumed to be one over uh, much smaller than uh, the velocity of uh, the speed of, um, of light, C. Okay. So, this is uh, the case, and under these assumptions, we have uh, also something important that is the Lorentz force. And the Lorentz force, uh, each field line is uh, subject to this uh, force. And this force is due to J uh, and B. J cross B. So under these conditions, we have this relation and then uh, enforced, and then, uh, and then uh, the force the Lorentz force given by J cross B. There is a mu somewhere. I will drop it. Okay, so uh, for this, we simplify uh, this equation, or this equation can be rewritten. You see we have here, I'm sorry, I have to be consistent. I use the cross, and uh, I try to remember to use the wedge. Uh, so the curl... Uh, so we have to put, uh, in place of E, uh, U cross B here. And there is a minus and a minus, so we have uh, Faraday's law. And Faraday's law says uh, DB DT equal, we substitute, we have the curl, first of all, and then the curl works on that term from home, U cross B. And uh, this is the law I referred to yesterday when we were talking about uh, vortex motion. In deriving the equation of vortex motion at a certain point, you meet this form. Uh, I show you the statement about the Lagrangian derivative, which is a convective derivative. Uh, it combines uh, time uh, variation with space variation, and the time variation uh, form is given there. So we are uh, ready to have uh, our set of equation. Now I write them down for the last time. The set of equations we deal with are the following, MHD, consists of uh, tackling the solution to this problem, du dt. This is Navier-Stokes minus grad p. Then we have, I want to put uh, for the last, very last time, the dissipative effects so that we have the full equations in front of us. So I will consider new, this uh, viscosity. I mentioned that uh, the viscosity terms of a second order derivatives on the velocity. And then I also mentioned the fact that we want to include the forces that are conservative, and the Lorentz force is uh, uh, such one. And the Lorentz force given there, J cross B, over there, J cross B is this one. I, I want to put the wedge as much as I can so that you understand. I'm sorry, I get confused. Uh, I use the, the cross, but on the blackboard is uh, bad to use it. All right. So this is, uh, say, Navier-Stokes. Huh? Is Navier-Stokes with, in MHD, with this term, with the Lorentz force. Then we have vorticity. D omega, let me write it in this way. D omega dt. And uh, I want to write it in this way because I want to recall this uh, structure but I have also to uh, take care of the viscosity terms now. So this would be the curl of uh, U cross uh, omega. Uh, sorry. 
um, plus uh, the same viscosity here, the same viscosity here, the second, uh, the second order, the second gradients come here, uh, del 2 omega. And then uh, I have to curl basically the contribution from U. So uh, this is a curl of J cross B. And finally, I have to take care of uh, Faraday's law, but uh, consistently with the classical fluid, I want to include, just to mention once, uh, the role of uh, uh, dis dissipative effects. So I have to include the resistivity, dB dt equal curl of uh, U cross B. And then plus resistive effect, del 2b. Fortunately for us, for me, I won't deal with this set of equations at all, but it's just nice to, to present this equation at least once. Hmm? At least once. So this is the big business of uh, solving these equations. Uh, you know, these are complicated enough, let alone the fact that the Navier-Stokes equations themselves are, uh, offer still challenging problems is the one of the major problem, open problem of classical physics. Still, uh, uh, existence, regularity of solutions of Navier-Stokes, plus uh, the effect of magnetic fields on that. Okay, so what uh, we will do, as, uh, as I mentioned a few times, uh, we will do this, this, and this. And of course, when you do that, uh, you have conserved uh, quantities and topology frozen. Topology is frozen because there is no way, whatever is the structure, remember Cauchy solutions tell you that whatever is the complexity of the field, the topological complexity of the field at a position T0, it remains forever as long as the flow map uh, is uh, well defined, it has an inverse, blah, blah, blah. I have a question. Yes? So, uh, this is set of equations just to give us a picture. We have both the fluid, the velocity field, uh, as well as a uh, magnetic field. That's why we just uh, saw velocity, vorticity there, u cross omega, and we have some u cross b. So uh, if the velocity and the uh, field, magnetic field, for example, omega and b, they are just in the same direction that would be the fluid, the, the lines of the fluid, field lines, can we just regard them exactly as the magnetic field lines? If uh, vorticity coincides with uh, magnetic lines, this is your question? Is this? Um, well, you have, in general, uh, it's, it's, it's hard to give to to answer, pardon me. That's called yeah, so th so you you may have in nature all sorts of uh, sure of possibilities. There are cases in which velocity and vorticity are aligned, which is a case uh, very important because uh, is a case where you have an excitement of. Uh, uh, complexity, so to speak, because you maximize helicity. We already, we already know this. I didn't talk about magnetic helicity, but I already talked about kinetic helicity. So it's the integral of u dot omega. If u and omega are parallel, then uh, of course you have maximum uh, kinetic helicity. And uh, um, but yes, you, sure, you can have a situation in which uh, the field, for example, vorticity is aligned with uh, B. 
or velocity is aligned with B? A. Velocity parallels to A. Also. Yeah. Uh, but velocity parallel to B is another interesting quantity. Okay. So that means the because uh, I, I, I might just mention it, but there is a... There are various definitions of helicities that include also the dot product of these, these, these fields. So that means we have two sets of uh, quantities. One set is kinetic ones, the other one the magnetic ones. Uh, for each group, we have a separate uh, helicity. Magnetic uh, helicity and kinetic helicity. Sure. Mutual Cross helicity. Yeah. 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 Yes. Thanks. Yes. Okay. Well, uh, I want to indeed move to prove that we have a certain conservation laws under ideal, ideal MHD. So if I do this, I should put here an ideal. Disregarding these quantities. And uh, I will uh, prove uh, two things. One is the conservation of flux, so to make a parallel with the conservation of uh, circulation, of vor vortex uh, circulation. And uh, the other uh, conserved. Uh, Law, uh, conservation law is uh, conservation of magnetic helicity. So this is uh, what I'll do in a moment. I start with the flux. Flux, uh, similarly, yesterday we talked about uh, uh, localized uh, structures like vortices, vortex tubes. We can equally think of uh, uh, having magnetic field lines that are Highly localized. Uh, in the notes, you will see later on, I put a little picture, is uh, barely visible, but it is visible, of, um, of um, uh, observations from satellite of plasma loops in the solar corona. And uh, you see, is a, is a poor picture, small scale, whatever, black and white, but it's very clear that these plasma loops are well-defined loops in uh, almost uh, empty space. So it makes sense uh, to think of magnetic fields that are highly localized, and they form tubes like uh, vortex line form tubes uh, in a fluid, in a classical fluid. So I will, uh, I will prove this uh, conservation of flux. So let's say Alfven... Um, Alfen uh, actually is like this. Alfen's uh, conservation conservation law for magnetic flux. So standardly, uh, I I you know is evident here. So I didn't say anything, but. You know, if you compare these two equations, it's evident. That's why I put them down. Okay, so I won't talk about this, but uh, you understand that there is uh, evidently a very strong analogy between vortex uh, dynamics and the transport of the magnetic field. So you would expect that similarly, in the ideal MHD case, uh, uh, the flux of that quantity, i.e. the field, through a surface, would be conserved. It's just natural to think about that. Uh, anyway, we can, uh, and uh, let me add one more thing. As uh, here, I mentioned the Cauchy solutions that establish a, a class of equivalence between a field omega at a position uh, initial and uh, a field omega at the position t. And by this, I denote, uh, say, if uh, at the positions uh, at time zero, uh, this is a, a knot, then this same knot is transported by the flow map to uh, the 
same knot type K, different geometry, but it's the same knot type. Similarly, so this is due to Cauchy. Similarly, we can say that a knot that is made of field lines uh, B at a certain time T0 is uh, transported to uh, a new uh, shape, a new geometry, but the same knot at a later time. Okay, flux. Uh, flux uh, is uh, the following uh, for ideal MHD. This is a result due to Alphen. Uh, um, for ideal MHD flow, the magnetic flux Uh, let's call it phi. Uh, phi, in general, is a function of t. Let's define it. Uh, well, if we have a tube in mind, it's very easy to define it. So I will uh, think of a tube. Uh, of course, the definition of a flux is general. is general. But if I think of a tube and I refer to one of these uh, cross section of this tube and I think of the field lines in... Uh, in uh, this uh, tube B, then uh, uh, I identify this sigma with the domain uh, cross section B dot nu. Nu is uh, just a normal, a normal to uh, to any surface here d two x. If uh, if I assume that these uh, these field lines are making up the, the, the cylindrical surface of this tube for simplicity, then evidently I have no field lines going through by definition, by assumption, so this won't contribute to the flux, and I will have only uh, the contribution through the cross-section sigma of the tube. So if we keep this example as a guideline for us, then we understand very well what is the flux, okay? is the contribution of the field through a surface. Okay, this flux, the theorem is uh, that this flux is conserved, is conserved in the fluid, i.e. that the derivative with respect to time, Lagrangian derivative of phi t0, which means that phi is a constant of motion. Okay. So uh, I will use again the transport theorem. That's why I introduced the transport theorem at the very beginning. Because once you do this, it's so easy everything. And if you go to books, everybody has his own way to derive things, and uh, you have to remember different types of derivation for each case, whereas uh, in our case it's so simple. You, you call this, uh, this uh, theorem uh, d, dt of uh, phi of t. So this is uh, the integral sigma you get in. You use transport theorem, right? So I have to remind you, maybe, uh, transport theorem for a dynamical quantity, so to speak, for a vector. So this is just uh, d dt of uh, g uh, vector, uh, OK, uh, in dv. This is uh, the total derivative of uh, g dt uh, plus uh, g d of u. And then uh, I like to remind you of uh, our definition of d dt, which is uh, the partial derivative with respect to time plus the convective term acting on something. So here we have the convective term to read hmm? in D, D, T. In capital D, we have a contribution from this and a contribution from this that works on G. 
And here we have G times this. So this becomes a D, B, D, T, the partial derivatives, uh, times nu D, 2, X, plus. Uh, now, you remember that uh, we, we uh, use to go from this, we left part of it in the volume, and part of it we used uh, divergence theorem to get uh, the flux through. Hmm? Let me step back because I want the young ones to follow. The change in time of this quantity hmm, is due to the change in time of the quantity inside a volume plus possible flux through the surface of the volume. Right? The total change in time of a quantity is due to the change in time this of a quantity inside the volume plus possible flux through the boundary of the volume. This is what the transport theorem tells you to do. So I have to think of this as made of this plus this that goes in here. So there is a divergence here. Divergence of uh, GU and I use the divergence theorem and I translate that into a surface theorem. Now here I start from a volume, sorry, a volume and I told you that I'm going to do part of it, this part, it will be done in terms of a surface, right? So here I start from a, from a surface, and I have to take care of the flux through the boundary of the surface, which is uh, the contour of the surface. It is the uh, one-dimensional less case than this, hmm? if we are in R3. Okay, so we do, we do this, and uh, from uh, here, I told you, we use uh, this and this together gives uh, the divergence of uh, GU, the divergence of GU, and so we use, in the volume, we use the divergent uh, integral, and the, divergent in the divergence uh, theorem gives us a flux through the surface. So the same here. We have uh, the integral on the boundary of sigma, which is C, B, times uh, uh, the velocity U, because it's a flux. U uh, cross DL, where L is the, you know, is the, is the contour of this uh, surface. All right? Okay, so now we use here, from this term, db dt, we have to go to the uh, Faraday's equation. And so we have uh, from Faraday's, d phi dt is equal to uh, integral of the curl of uh, u, uh, sorry, cross b. Uh, this is over sigma, of course, and uh, as a new d2x. And then uh, we have to do, uh, we, just, uh, we just switch these, uh, these uh, terms. So there is a minus sign in front, minus circulation of uh, u cross b dl. Okay, so uh, first step is uh, to go inside the integral with the total derivative, apply the transport theorem, use the divergence uh, uh, theorem to transform the volume integral into a surface integral. Here we transform the surface integral into a contour integral through this divergence theorem, and then we have a flux, and then this flux... Uh, uh, we just uh, uh, switch the position of these vectors in order to have a minus in front of here, and then we apply Faraday's equation here. All right, so now we get to 
uh, the final the final step. Uh, we use uh, Stokes. We use uh, Stokes. So we have uh, the curl of this quantity to the surface. So we can reduce the sigma integral to a line integral. All right? So we reduce that. Stokes. Let, let me put it here. Stokes. Stokes theorem means uh, that we have a u cross uh, b, u cross b, and then this u cross b uh, rotates, is a curl, rotates on the boundary of sigma c uh, along the elementary uh, length uh, dl, and this is minus the other part c u cross b dl, which evidently is zero. Again, flux theorem can be presented in many ways, and uh, uh, the effort that you pay to understand at the very beginning the transport theorem uh, helps you in deriving many things. And actually, this is the idea behind uh, so much work that was done in the uh, uh, 100 years ago or so. OK. Then uh, we are at the stage to prove uh, conservation of uh, uh, magnetic helicity. OK, so what is magnetic helicity? First of all, magnetic helicity. Magnetic helicity is uh, uh, defined by the integral, let's call it H, M, function of T in general. And this integral, as uh, by analogy, you may guess what it is, because we saw this uh, situation uh, before, the analogy between vorticity and magnetic field. We have to have uh, uh, a field times its curl. So either we have a choice, right? We have a choice. I don't know anything. I think uh, liberally, and I think, OK, I might have a B and then the curl of B. I do, I do know what is the curl of B. is uh, is hidden now, but we saw it. Hmm? Home's law is Home's law. Home's law in the case where the uh, conduction currents are zero. And the Holmes law says, uh, in that case, uh, that uh, B and uh, J are related. Indeed, J is the curl of B. So I can construct an helicity that is uh, J dot B. Here, I'll uh, introduce, and of course, is is used. Is used. It's called the electric uh, helicity. I can't remember the name. Is used perfectly well. In this case, it's useful to refer to the magnetic context. And the magnetic context as an A times a B, where A is the vector potential of B. Um, this is in the domain of B. And uh, uh, before I forget, I will put here a W. And uh, this W, uh, uh, it's better to say a few things. First of all, that uh, uh, B is uh, defined in terms of A, that uh, I choose uh, a gauge for A, and I choose the Coulomb gauge. Uh, so that uh, div A is equal to zero. So I fix the gauge in that fashion. And then uh, it's still important to add one more thing. Uh, the domain of definition of B, uh, the domain of definition of B, so I take B, B such 
that uh, b dot nu, nu being the normal to the boundary of uh, w, nu normal to dw, is uh, zero. So on uh, the boundary. In case we have uh, field lines uh, localized in space, like if it were a flux tube, then uh, this is uh, an easy condition to refer to because you think that uh, field lines are parallel to the surface everywhere. And so we can think no flux uh, through the surface, a very localized field. And so this condition it tells you that the surface of this flux tube is a magnetic surface itself. Right? So it's a material surface and is a mat uh, made by magnetic field lines that are all tangent to this surface. So this is the uh, definition and the conditions for magnetic helicity to be well defined. I remember uh, is exactly the same as I did for, for uh, the kinetic helicity. And now we want to prove that this quantity is conserved. So I told you uh, proof uh, of the helicity being conserved uh, was uh, uh, done by two people, Voltier, 58 and uh, Moreau in uh, 61. Um, uh, in the magnetic uh, case uh, was Volcher, 58, and the paper remained uh, um, unnoticed for some time. Actually, also the paper of Moreau remained unnoticed for some time. Um, conservation of magnetic helicity. Again, all these uh, derivations are done in modern terms, and so I don't know exactly the derivation. I probably had a look at the time um, of the derivation of uh, Voltier. Uh, I think uh, Keith Moffat uh, pointed out that uh, there are uh, a couple of, uh, I wouldn't say, I don't know if mistakes or uh, little points uh, that are not quite right. Anyway, theorem. So this is a result of uh, uh, conservation of uh, magnetic helicity. Uh, helicity. In ideal MHD, right. So this quantity, HM, HM is uh, conserved in the ideal MHD. So we have uh, D H of T in general DT being zero means uh, H is constant in time. Okay, so first thing is that uh, we have to prove. So prove it goes like this. Let's uncurl, uncurl Faraday's equation. And this is done by taking the A from it, the A dt, this is U cross B. And when we do this, you know, is a if you curl it, if you take a curl, you do derivatives. If you uncurl, you have to have constants of integrations. So we have a constant of integration here that we will call it uh, grad phi, hmm? a potential associated, or a gauge. So this, uh, this grad phi, be being a grad, has its curl zero. 
okay? So we take, we take uh, this uh, quantity to be like that. Now, because of the Coulomb condition, let's say on A, on A, then uh, evidently if we take uh, div A equals zero, uh, then we have uh, uh, the solution for phi. Hmm? Because div A, div A equals zero, but A is, uh, uh, has this uh, phi in it, so we have uh, immediately from this uh, the uh, del 2 of phi equal uh, minus grad of uh, u cross b. Hmm? Okay. This is, this is a way to fix phi. All right. By using Faraday's, now by using Faraday. Faraday's equation and uh, um, and the solenoidal condition for B and uh, div B equals zero. We have we have to construct helicity d dt of uh, something a dot B in our case. So Faraday's equation helps us to define uh, uh, dA dB. So we have uh, uh, dt, so we have a dot, actually the other way around, uh, Faraday helps us to define db dt, the curl of uh, u curl b, and then we have this uh, uh, grad on, uh, on, uh, on phi to take care of, and so we are there. And then uh, I mentioned uh, two days ago, probably, that uh, the, or yesterday, that uh, to prove the conservation of magnetic helicity, uh, you need uh, a little bit of uh, algebra or vector analysis. So we'll make use of a, of, a, of a vector identity. Use vector identity in the form that I write because I want to keep track of what I wrote, so I will explicit it like this. A dot, I want to use that expression. So the curl of uh, U cross B. And this is uh, the uh, div, uh, sorry, this is, um, yes, is the div of uh, A cross uh, B cross U. And now use this uh, vector identity I mentioned. Uh, you go to books and you find that this can be written as uh, uh, A dot U B minus A dot B U. Okay, so right, we need the, the total derivative, and we are just with the partial derivative, so we have to play a little bit with these uh, structures to say thus uh, d dt of a dot b is equal to uh, this quantity. We have to uh, substitute this term here and uh, extract uh, uh, this quantity, so we are with a div of uh, what? Of uh, phi, I'm putting together things, uh, plus uh, a dot u. And then remember that uh, there is div b equals zero. Okay. Now we're done, because when we see Divergence of fields.
we think of a flux. And if we think of a flux, we have to keep in mind the condition on B being, uh, uh, having normal component zero on the surface, on the bounding surface of the domain of definition of, uh, of B. So that's why we are now close to say that uh, indeed that quantity is, uh, is uh, zero. Uh, okay, here, just to make sure that we understand each other, I should add a sense uh, uh, div, uh, well, that was obvious, but um, div uh, a b of uh, of uh, u is equal to u uh, dot grad uh, a b. Okay, because I want to construct this term. All right. Okay, so. Uh, D D T of uh, H M is equal to the integral. I go inside. This is a material volume. Sure, I use uh, the same uh, uh, transport theorem if you like. Uh, but now B is uh, has no flux uh, through the surface, no flux through the surface. So we have just uh, the D3x, uh, this is just V magnetic, let's say, of div, I put everything inside, uh, phi plus A times U, but here I have uh, my B. Hmm? And we said B has no component across the surface. So if I use uh, a divergence theorem, this gives you zero. So we are uh, now at the stage where we have a very good parallel between a set of information and another set of information. And uh, this parallel maybe bifurcates, goes in two directions according to what we want to uh, study and what we want to understand from nature. And the parallel is, uh, we saw is about, uh, on one hand, uh, very clear, vorticity and magnetic fields. On the other, I mentioned, you know, the helicity. When I talked about the helicity, you take a field that times the curl of the field. So what about the B and J? So you have this, uh, this, uh, this other helicity, the integral of uh, B and its curl. So there is another parallel, a parallel between uh, uh, the electric current and vorticity. So we have two different analogies. So consistently with what is uh, taught, uh, analogies. Let's mention this. Uh, there is one, uh, one analogy is called the so-called non-perfect, non-perfect analog analogy, and uh, is between uh, Euler, Euler's equation, and these uh, are omega is given by the curl of U, and then we have uh, the Helmholtz transport equation for omega, the curl of uh, U cross omega, and finally helicity, kinetic helicity. Kinetic helicity is uh, just the integral on this uh, volume W of uh, U dot omega. And then another set of equations, and these equations are ideal MHD equations. And these uh, says uh, B 
is given by the curl of A. And then uh, we have uh, the Faraday's law, dB dt equal the curl of uh, U cross uh, B. And finally, helicity, magnetic helicity. Uh, integral over the magnetic domain of A dot B. D3X star. Okay. So you see, you see very well the analogy. The problem is uh, what I anticipated yesterday. The problem is that uh, uh, there the is, is rather formal. Why? Because omega responds somehow to you as well. Omega is transported. It induces uh, a velocity field through Bios of our law. But this velocity field, you remember the decomposition of the fields? The velocity field induced by omega is part of the, of the field of motion because the field of motion is, is, is made of three contributions. One, we call it, uh, say, translation, uh, deformation, so to speak, and rotation. So the, the rotation bit is due to omega, and then there is the rest. And so the fluid... Uh, React on vorticity. So this is the non-linearity hidden also clearly in uh, Navier-Stokes, but is typical non-linearity of Euler equations. Here is, uh, in this sense, uh, in the sense of uh, reaction, reacting at something, there is no reaction on you. The fields are totally, they don't talk to each other. So you have a magnetic field that is transported by the fluid U. So in that sense, uh, you cannot talk about a perfect analogy, although, although there are lots of things in common, because as we will uh, see uh, from this afternoon and tomorrow, we will see that, uh, uh, of course, we can give a topological interpretation of this quantity, which is exactly the same as this one. Actually, I will, I will talk about the topological interpretation of this one uh, just, just because I, I, I think it's fun to change a little bit uh, topic and uh, stick to the magnetic fields to present uh, things in that order. All right, but there is another analogy, and uh, this is a so-called stricter analogy, so let's call it perfect perfect analogy perfect analogy and uh, we like we like uh, perfect things and the uh, perfect things are nice but sometimes we pay a price you know uh, you know paradise is beautiful is perfect but ah, you have to you have to pay a price a little price to have to behave absolutely perfectly in all life and so Ah, it's hard sometimes. And uh, it's so hard that one, uh, to, to, to behave that way, you know, you have, I don't know, you have to be, abs for example, one way to behave in that way is to be absolutely standing. You don't do anything for all your life. Uh, probably you are perfect. You don't do absolutely nothing, anything. So perfect analogy in this case means uh, that we have to be steady. Time does not exist. Steady. If we are in steady condition, then we have an analogy here that is perfect. So steady condition. Steady condition for Euler's equation, for Euler's equation means uh, that uh, we can reduce, we can rewrite them over there. We have uh, the in, uh, let's say, in steady conditions, Then, uh, uh, over there, this quantity is zero, right? Because d omega dt is zero. d omega dt is zero, so we can write from there Euler's, Euler's equations become, become these uh, get reduced to omega. Sorry, but I want to be consistent with what I wrote, omega. Uh, the definition curl of u 
this become u cross omega u cross o this is zero right if this is zero then we have u cross omega equal a function grad and we can call it h is um, related to pressure and uh, then we have uh, as usual the helicity kinetic helicity so this is uh, just the integral u omega in helicity domain in uh, in uh, vorticity domain okay and then we have mhd and the mhd is uh, that now uh, steady condition we can think of uh, well the definition of uh, of the electric current curl of uh, curl of b curl of b and then uh, in uh, in uh, static conditions you have your notes so you can go back to the beginning when i wrote uh, navier stokes equation you have a look and you you have to set uh, the time variation equal to zero and so you have on one uh, on the two sides you have uh, grad p minus grad p in a steady condition minus grad p plus the lorentz force plus the lorentz force the lorentz force is j cross b and all this is equal to zero if all this is equal to zero because uh, there is no time variation then we can rewrite this in this form j cross b equal grad p so this comes from navier stokes in the mhd case and then we have magnetic helicity Now, in this case, uh, uh, it's exactly satisfy this perfect analogy. So we have an analogy here, not really between B and omega, but between the electric field and omega. So the analogy is uh, omega corresponding to J, say, and uh, U corresponds to B and uh, uh, H would correspond to minus P there is a minus somewhere I'm missing uh, in, in the notes as well well um, so this allows us to uh, use this analogy to inspect properties I already mentioned explicitly one case yesterday the case pardon me you're looking for the other way around perhaps no ah here thank you j dot b yeah you're right um oh done okay I'd like to tell you something. I'd like to tell you this. This is an idea, is a strategy that uh, uh, I, I think is rooted in Arnold. Um, and the strategy is the following. Know, yeah? That is G dot B. Is that should, should be uh, cross, cross, uh, No, this is, well, I, I don't remember the name. Uh, electric, uh, do you remember the name of this quantity? J, J, J dot B. I, I don't remember the name. It's, it's cross. I think it's wrong. It's a mistake. Current elicity. Is, I'm sorry, it's a mistake. It's not cross. Cross elicity is, <laughs> yes, is U, is, uh, is the velocity times uh, the magnetic field. There are several helicities and... I made a mistake there. Uh, so this is uh, current elicity because it's associated with the electric current. Or uh, before I said the electric elicity is not. It, it was closed, but. Um, so which is the strategy? Let me give you an example first. I, I gave you already an example yesterday. The example is uh, uh, you build a tokamak and you want a machine 
uh, with the fields inside that are at least uh, starting from the steady case, because you want a machine that is uh, stable, <laughs> functionally stable. So you don't want to start with something unsteady, right? So you want to start at least with something steady, hoping that uh, there are no instability as you heat up the plasma. And the plasma is heated up by uh, the uh, interplay of uh, electric and magnetic fields. Basically, magnetic fields are confining the plasma, are confining uh, the, the electrically charged plasma. But these magnetic fields uh, should be in a, in a steady configuration. And the steady solution is given by the grad shafranoff equation and is a, you know, a torus, what you aim at, and so you look for a toroidal steady configuration of magnetic fields. This toroidal steady configuration is not a perfect tor a mathematical torus with a cross-section circular, but is a D shape. And that is the solution for the vortex ring case. Tomorrow I will uh, show you some pictures. For the vortex ring case. So the two fields, the propagation of a vortex of a smoke ring, steadily propagating in the fluid. So it, it, it moves with a constant velocity. It doesn't decay, right? And the configuration of magnetic fields in a toroidal shape, so they are not perturbed, they stay there. They satisfy the same equation, the same equation. So you have uh, a static condition that allows you to find the solution, for example here, for example here, and to transfer it by analogy to this set, or the other way around. So this is rather convenient, because remember of the non-perfect analogy, the non-perfect analogy has uh, this uh, devilish part in it. So what uh, you can think of doing? Well, I can think of doing something like this. I work here, in this context. I start with the field B. I look for an equilibrium solution to the steady case in a B inequilibrium, which satisfies this context. Then I move to this case, and by analogy, I can identify a velocity, a vorticity, and I go there. So I can look for solutions in a steady state conditions, and hoping that they will help me in general. And so this is just a strategy of working. So you look for a solution in a set, then this set in a steady state intersects this set, of solution, you move into this set and you go back to the other problem. So this strategy has been used in uh, many uh, contexts, and one particular context is uh, uh, in searching for topologically complex uh, configuration. So you can uh, think, okay, I now for a moment, maybe a few decades, <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll uh, leave aside the problem of vorticity. I move to magnetic fields. And on magnetic fields, uh, the situation, because of, of uh, this lack of interplay between U and B, I can think of uh, modeling a magnetic field, see how it behaves. If uh, it's knotted or linked, I can study its properties. And if some of these properties I find are steady, uh, they stay there and there are solutions of the equation, then I can think, I can infer. The same is true for vorticity, and then eventually I consider the unsteady case, starting from the steady case. So this is the situation. So that's why I'm now moving uh, consistently towards uh, magnetic fields. We leave aside the story of vorticity, we consider magnetic fields, magnetic structures, magnetic knots, and relaxation of magnetic energy. Before doing this, I appeal again to your imagination and to Faraday's work. Faraday's uh, worked on these uh, magnetic fields, experiments, and uh, he noticed that they were behaving like elastic strings. Oh, by the way, I come up with a, a solution of my conundrum. I, 
I, I don't know at all. If it, don't buy it, okay? It's not true. It's something I made up uh, uh, yesterday night, uh, thinking of how on, how on earth uh, Fermi could uh, confirm almost immediately the work of Alphen. And it came up in my mind that uh, the entry exam of uh, Fermi <laughs> of Fermi at, uh, in Pisa, Scuola Normale di Pisa. The exam paper was um, several questions, but the first one to students, not first year students, to, to, to students who were applying to enter. You know, it's, a, it's extremely, it's a small college, very small, uh, but rather prestigious. So it, it's not ranking high in this table of rankings, you know, it's, it's down. But because of the college, it's, it hosts, it selects 50, 50 students in the whole country <laughs> per year. And the entry exam of Fermi was uh, to derive from first principles uh, uh, the equation of an elastic string. <laughs> That's why I thought uh, it might be that the reason. An elastic string, you know, you pull tight and perturbed. And uh, I'm not so sure because I, I, I didn't check. I just uh, remind, uh, remembered to have read somewhere that uh, many, many years ago I read this. So I, I excuse you, if, I, I, please excuse me if, if, I'm, if I'm wrong with the misquoting facts, but uh, it's almost correct uh, that he was so talented that uh, not only he read the right correctly uh, from first principle this equation of a vibrating string, but he found the solutions, new solutions. And when he was interviewed by the committee, uh, the three professors or four professors in front of him uh, said, uh, oh, this is wonderful, you've done very well, etc., etc." So certainly you, you will pass and you will be one of our uh, students. But, you know, we, we, we've been discussing, uh, I, we cannot find out where exactly you you uh, studied these uh, particular solutions. And he said, uh, well, I didn't study these solutions in any, in, in, in any place. What, what do you mean? Oh, well, I had some time and I derived them. <laughs> and so these solutions were derived on the spot by, by Enrico Fermi. Anyway, so perhaps this is the reason why he didn't believe Alphen in the first place. And when he left, uh, we're talking many, many years later now, uh, when he left uh, to go back to Sweden, he probably recalled uh, some of his, uh, of his uh, interest in, in, uh, in mechanics. All right, so this, uh, this helps us to remember that uh, flux tubes made by magnetic field lines behave like elastic bands. So we will keep our, uh, our analogy with elastic bands in mind. I can even add, I never wrote it down, but I don't even know how, uh, you know, I did it many years ago. I presented the poster at the conference, and then it went lost. So. But it's a matter of a really not a like Fermi. It's a, it's a, it's a very exa simple example, sim simple exercise to do. If you, if you go in the incompressible limit, you can prove that uh, uh, you can derive, uh, so to speak, a, a modulus. It is like an elastic module. It's a shear module. A shear module. And uh, it's amazing. The order of magnitude uh, with the due constants, etc., etc., is uh, very similar in the incompressible limit to the elastic case. So that you can think really of a flux tube that if you stretch it, it gets uh, squeezed down as an elastic band, because flux is conserved. Flux is conserved. So if you, if you pull it, it goes down in cross-section, and the field intensity increases. But more than that is uh, the action of a Lorentz force. What does the Lorentz force on these magnetic field lines? Well, in your notes, you have a rather elaborate calculation with appropriate orthogonal coordinates, which are not only circular coordinates, uh, cylindrical coordinates, but these, these coordinates, you will read it, uh, are getting corrected by the amount of torsion that there is in the helix. So the usual cylindrical coordinates applied to the helical case are not quite correct because are not 
orthonormal. There are lots of papers with these, uh, 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 with these coordinates. But you can prove that uh, with a due correction due to the torsion of the helix, you get new coordinates that these are giving you an orthonormal reference frame. Well, with these coordinates, you can work out the contribution of the, of the force that uh, is uh, received from the magnetic field lines. So in order to do that, I won't do that uh, in details, but I want to give you an idea of what we get. <clears throat> and what we get is uh, absolutely easy and simple to remember, and is uh, one way to remember it is to think of elastic bands. So playing with elastic bands is uh, one way to understand. Uh, so imagine that you have your uh, localized field in a tube. And now uh, I take this field B inside this cylinder and uh, I want to write it. Let me check what I did in notation. I want to write it, I want to decompose this in the, possibly in a simple way so that I can do some analysis. Uh, consistently with this geometry, with this cylindrical geometry, I would say, okay, first of all, I will uh, decompose this field in the two elements. One is a contribution from BM inside. Hmm? So the field lines would, uh, would, uh, would uh, wind up around the uh, center, central line. And this is due to BM. And then there is a contribution. You see these field lines are going up somewhere. Maybe I can use a different color. So you see what I mean, a red one. Um, these field lines, of course, mainly are longitudinal. This is the total field B. And the total field B will be uh, is uh, is uh, is is thought is assumed to be decomposed in a meridional field and an axial field. The axial field is along uh, this direction. Okay, so there is a, a meridional field B M like this combined with the axial field, and the axial field is prevalent prevalent on the on the uh, on the on the meridional field. Then I want to have uh, a little bit more uh, general approach, and I would say that BM, <coughs> let me use uh, coordinates here, let's say cylindrical. Um, I don't want to, to use, um, let, let's use this, Mercier, Mercier coordinates. are a little bit more general than uh, cylindrical. Um, R, E theta, which looks uh, theta, let's say, and S. S is along uh, the axis. R is, of course, uh, in the cross-section, and theta is uh, the azimuthal angle. Now, these are, remember, these are not exactly the classical ones you use, I will put a, a little r there to denote the fact that there is a relationship between the standard theta and theta r, and the relationship is uh, due to the fact that there is a contribution of torsion if uh, the tube is, uh, is um, twisted in space. So uh, with these coordinates, I'll uh, think of uh, this decomposition as zero along r, because I think of the field lines uh, along, mainly along, uh, along uh, the, um, the axis. B theta is, of course, present in the meridional field. And I will uh, choose uh, some generality. I will choose B theta to depend, uh, indeed, on R and uh, theta. And eventually, this theta would, can depend on S. Because uh, as you go inside, we want some complexity of this flux tube. We want a tube made like a, like a cord, hmm? a rope, a rope, an alpine rope. 
or a rope uh, that you use on the sea, hmm? on the boat. You look, you cut it through, and uh, you see the cross-section. And the cross-section is made of threads, and these threads, they have a different helical pitch and a different uh, uh, configuration in space due to their uh, different, uh, um, different location. So I want to have some dependence on, on this in order to have a rope of field lines that are twisted, twisted inside, inside the tube. And uh, this is uh, zero. And finally, BA. <coughs> and BA, similarly, will have no dependence on R, of course, no dependence on uh, theta, but uh, along, uh, along S uh, would be a BS uh, function of R. OK, so this is the field. Now, with these coordinates and this field, uh, we lose interest because we have to do some algebra. Why I want to do some algebra? Oh, I want to find out the force. And the force is uh, the uh, J cross B. But J is the curl of B. So given B, I can work out the force. Given the complexity of B, I can work out the force. So, uh, all right, I won't do this because it is very boring. <laughs> you have some details in the, in the notes. Uh, it's a lot, a lot of calculations because, first of all, you have to have your operators uh, in these coordinates. And then once you have your operators in these coordinates, you have to take care of the dependence of these various quantities on S, on theta, blah, blah, blah. So you do your calculations. You get an expression that is pretty complicated. But the crudest information, the crudest term, it's well known. It's known since... Uh, what is the crudest term? Well, the, the lowest order term is uh, what is called a, a curvature term. So we have a Lorentz force, and the Lorentz force that acts on this tube, F, will uh, we'll have uh, its three contribution, of uh, FR, F theta, and FS. But these are not very uh, useful. So we can rearrange these uh, three contributions into basically two contributions. F will be made by an F that is uh, parallel to the axis of the tube, something, F of uh, blah, 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 of the field, B A, B M, uh, B theta, and B R, and uh, an F uh, perpendicular. Uh, these are two vectors. Hmm? I can choose to rearrange F and the components in this fashion, a perpendicular term. And this perpendicular term will be a function of uh, B theta and B R. But then I can drop uh, all my sophisticated approach there to be very simple. To be so simple, say, OK, suppose this tube is a, is a, is a thin filament. Then uh, can, I, can, I, can I say something about this force? Yes, of course. You can think of a one field line. And if you consider one field line, so you drop down all this complicated approach, which I needed, because I needed later to do some more sophisticated analysis. That's why I mention it. But if you want just to understand the behavior of, of a field line, you may say that the field line orthogonal contribution goes approximately like a curvature, the local curvature, the curvature of the axis of your tube or the curvature of the field line times the normal direction if I choose a Frenet Serre uh, system on the line. Okay, I have my field line B, I can choose uh, uh, to use uh, the unit tangent, and with the unit tangent, I will have to identify a normal direction. Now, uh, as usual, you know, you have to put a, a Frenet frame somewhere like this, 
And so you have a normal direction and the binormal, and the binormal direction. Tangent, normal, and binormal. Hmm? Uh, you remember what we did uh, the very first lecture. If uh, x denotes the position, if x denotes the, this is a fixed reference frame, if x denotes the position of a point on a line, then we have, uh, I can uh, recall you the uh, Freinet. Freinet system, Freinet reference system is given by T, N, and B. And uh, T is just defined as uh, dx. I take x, a curve given by x function of s only. This is s coordinate somewhere. And then I have dx, ds. If s is arc length, the, uh, this contribution has a unit length. So this is the definition of the unit tangent. And then, just because I wrote uh, this equation, I recall you the frenet serret equation. We will use it later. I, I won't mention them now, but uh, I, will, I will make use of frenet serret equations in a moment. Uh, how these uh, triad, tangent normal and binormal, change along the curve. Hmm? So how they change it because I want to take the derivative with respect to arc length of the tangent of the normal and the binormal, and uh, these are the equations that control this change. For the moment, that's enough, but I want to say this. This is my simple-minded equation. I have a field line, and it moves uh, according to the local curvature along the normal. What does it mean? It means that... Uh, you take uh, your rubber band, you stretch it, and when it's stretched, you release it. Ideally, you see that this rubber band will shrink. So it will be subject to a motion, so to speak, along uh, the unit principle of this idealized circular situation, configuration, and it will shrink towards the center of curvature. And the intensity with which it will move is given by the local curvature. The more is bent, the faster will move if it were a velocity. I said uh, we stretch a band. And you say, well, Renzo, you mentioned the analogy with elastic bands, but uh, an elastic band on a table doesn't move at all. Aha, this is the... A little trick, and the little trick is this. Imagine, now this is the very last step of your analogy, imagine that uh, uh, the magnetic field, natural length, the natural length of a magnetic field, imagine that is zero. So whatever is your length, it will be subject to a shrinking flow, to a is like a, a rubber band that has zero natural length. So whatever is your, rubber, your new <laughs> rubber band will be always subject to tension. Okay? So it's a rubber band that whatever is its length is always under tension. And so it will shrink. It will shrink exactly as a, rubber, as a real rubber band of a given length. So you deform it from its natural length and you will feel the tension and the shrinking. And the mathematicians call this a shrinking flow acting on the band. And now I stop with this uh, little problem. You take a rubber band that is always shrinking because it's always subject to a tension like a magnetic field line and you think, what about if it is a knot? A loose knot that is made of magnetic lines. It won't stay loose. It will shrink always because we said this is the force acting on each point of this, uh, field, of this physical field line. It will shrink but is knotted. It cannot shrink to zero because the flux is conserved. Okay, we start from there. We take a break of...
20 minutes, 50, yeah, okay.